I thought we would look first at the evolution of this doctrine, because I think one of the things that we have to understand, and this is a really important, not just for the doctrine of the Trinity, but for the development of Christianity itself, it, that all of the essential doctrines of Christianity, in fact, this would be true of the biblical accounts as well, right? When we look at the Tanakh, its stories, they're always written in light of the audience that they were intended to address, right? So this is really important. Uh, I still find when I talk to people and we talk about the Genesis account, uh, especially if I talk to younger people, they're like, oh, the Adam and Eve were so lucky to, to have God talking to them like that. And I'm, wait, I said, wait a minute, that story wasn't written to Adam and Eve. It was written to people who came much, much later to help them understand what was happening. So don't start thinking that the story of Noah, the story of, of Abraham, was written to Abraham. Let's look at the audience that it was intended to, to address, and then we can figure out the cultural and, and linguistic elements of that story in that audience. Um, just can take a break here. Roseanne, are you getting warm? Because I can feel the heat. Yeah, well, I don't know what you did, but heat on, did you? Then I turned the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, yeah, definitely, yeah, I could not. Just set it on what you wanted to wind up at. You sure it's yes. not just the subject? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, yeah, it's not the subject. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so the point is that when we look at the way the Trinity was developed, one of the things that we must understand is what was happening in the environment of the church, that is in the social, political, economic realm of the church, when these doctrines were developed, right? They didn't just birth out of... The, <laughs> They were not ex nihilo creations. Right? <laughs> they came about because of something that was happening in the, in the need of the people that was going to be addressed by the development of these church ideas. And, um, and I'm going to just share with you some material. This is not original. It comes from this great book by Richard Rubenstein called When Jesus Became God. And the interesting thing about this book is it's not theology. Um, Rubenstein is is a, he's a professor of conflict history, right? So what's really interesting is he only looks at it in terms of what were the political, social, and economic, obviously, and theological issues, and why did those come into conflict with each other, and how come the doctrine of the, the Trinity developed from that, okay? So it's, and the best part about this book is it's not, ex, it's not uh, exceedingly technical. It reads like a novel. The guy is a great writer, and you can, and it's just. I mean, I'll give you an example. This is this is how it starts. You know, you're waiting for this really great theological tome, and uh, mm -hmm. and he starts off. By the time the men at the front of the mob smashed through the prison gates, the crowd had grown until it was near overflowing the square like water squirting from the sides of a fountain. I mean, does any academic write like yeah. that? No, he's a novelist. He's a novelist, right. So he's writing this real history about real people from a novel point of view, and it's really, really fun to read. Okay? We met a guy, had him in our house. He thought we were very fascinating historically. He's not a Christian, he's a Jew, obviously. Yes. And he's a brilliant light music pianist. I mean, outstandingly good at light classical wow. class music. Yes. This was the connection here between music it, and. No, I think it's it Pythagoras, so the music of the spheres, the way that you <laughs> yeah. know, God created the, Very the, the for, he created the universe according to musical tones. Yeah. Right? So it's all connected. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at some of the things that he points out. And the first thing that he points out, of course, is that you have to ask your question. Your, so questions about the role that Christianity was playing in the empire, right? It's, we have this, unfortunately, I think we have this naive view that somehow the Roman Empire was, was avowedly pagan, and it, and it took an enormous effort of all of these evangelists to actually convert the population to Christianity. But that's not kind of what happened. What happened is the, uh, the emperor and, and the... Um, more famous bishops, the ones who had power, began changing the shape of the culture around them by replacing pagan ideas or syncretizing mm -hmm. pagan ideas with Christian beliefs so that people's identity shifted. Mm -hmm. And by the time you start getting into the arguments about what happened with the Trinity, 
in 300, right? You've already had 150 to 200 years of cultural shaping as a result of the influence of this trend to, to syncretize pagan ideas into the Christian church, right? So the political situation in the empire, when, when this starts to develop, is, um, you know, it's at the end of the, it's, we're reaching the end of the Roman Empire. So there's all kinds of, of political tension in the empire. Not only is it being attacked by um, other empires outside of, out of, outside of the Roman influence, but inside it's starting to fracture, right? It's very much like the political situation today where we have a real diversity in opinion and the effort of the emperor is to hold this together because he doesn't want to have a civil war while he's trying to fight an outside war, right? And so the emperor gets involved many, many times in this, in not just one emperor, but several emperors get involved in trying to bring about some kind of unity in the religious body because the identity of the population is now tied to their religion. Once they left pagan ideas behind or they, or they syncretized those into the Christian faith, they identified themselves with a religious um, affiliation. And so who they were, you know, if you were in the Roman Empire and you said, well, who are you? They, they probably would tell you their ethnicity and their religion as the identifying markers, right? They don't tell you where, where they live, what they do. They start talking about their faith because now it's become so much a part of the culture that it actually identifies who they are. So religion becomes a very important political topic because it causes so much fragmentation in the empire, right? Yeah. Um, the result of all of that is that by the time we get to the, the, the seed of what happens for the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, and it doesn't start off as a Trinitarian idea, it starts off with this, what do we do with Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Um, by the time we get to that, we have two really important centers of power, religious power, and because religion is tied into the culture, political power as well. Those two centers are Alexandria and Constantinople. <clears throat> Constantinople, you know, for us, we think Rome was the center of the Roman Empire. But it wasn't the center of the Roman Empire. Constantinople was the center of the Roman Empire. Constantine built, built the Hagia Sophia. The, and by the way, you can still go to Istanbul and, and walk through the Hagia Sophia. It just has a huge Islamic symbol hanging from the ceiling now. Um, but, but Dandolo, who was the one of the last doges of Venice is, the, is buried in the Hagia Sophia. He's the only Westerner buried there. <clears throat> so you can see that there was a, a connection between Constantinople and the West through Venice. A long history about how Venice, the power of the Venetian Empire was all through the Mediterranean and obviously tied to religious belief as well. So Constantinople represented the, the empire's political and religious center, Constantine, Constantinople, and Alexandria represented the empire's <coughs> philosophical and religious center, right? Because the Greek population that, that was um, responsible for Hellenistic education in the empire was centered in Alexandria. So Alexandria became a very important uh, city for what happened in this tension that develops over the next hundred years, okay? Um, Alexandria was controlled originally by uh, a bishop, later by Athanasius, who started off as a deacon and became the bishop. And Athanasius actually becomes so powerful that at one point he, he basically says the emperor is not fit to serve <laughs> because he doesn't, the emperor, and he don't, at one point, point didn't agree on the theology. But Athanasius is one of those guys who, uh, <coughs> You know, maybe I can say it's, he, has a he almost has a Napoleon complex. He's, yeah. he's not a big guy, um, but he, he wants powerful control of the theological um, arena. And as a result of that, he has bishops who are aligned with him and opposed to his arch enemy, Arius. Yeah. Right. And so the two of them represent the two sides of this argument. Mm -hmm. And they use every technique possible to convince the opposite side that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And those techniques include mm -hmm. 
excommunication, yeah. mob violence, beatings, imprisonment, exile, murder, everything that you can, I mean, this is politics. This isn't religion. You don't sit down and have a textual argument over what the verse means. After you've had the textual argument and the other guy doesn't agree with your compelling argument, right? That, well, ultimately, I mean, you excommunicate him, then you exile him. If he still hangs around, you eventually have a mob you know, storm in and break through into the prison walls and carry the guy out and hang him. Uh -huh. If that doesn't work and you can't get the mob inside that way, then what's the obvious solution? Well, the guy is obviously from the devil. He's been influenced by Satan. You have to get rid of this demonic influence. I mean, all of these things show up in this argument. Right? That's the in, church. At that that's time. the church, yeah. That's the church. Yeah. church right. Kids. So inside the church, there's this war going on that keeps the church split. And the emperor, of course, on the outside, is interested in one and only one thing. Uniformity across the empire, because he can't deal with this internal conflict that's going on that causes one city to be at war with another. Okay? So, from the empire's, from the empire's perspective, this is the worst thing that could happen politically, because now, I don't know if, you know, if I'm in Alexandria, half of the city is Arian, half of the city is, is follows Athanasius, if I go to... Rome, it's the split the other way. If I go to Constantinople, it's something else. Nobody knows how to get control of this thing. Right? So what happens? So Athanasius, the Athanasian doctrine starts off like this. Remember, uh, the Trinity doesn't develop until very late. At first, you have only this issue over the Divine Father and the Divine Son. The Holy Spirit doesn't show up until right at the end when they finally solve this issue. Okay? But the real issue is, what do you do with Jesus? Right? So Athanasius says, Jesus is God incarnate, sent by the Father to take the form of a human being, sacrificed, raised from the dead, and reinstated with all the original divinity that he voluntarily divested in the incarnation. Mm -hmm. This is, you recognize the, the ideas that come from the Pauline letters. It's the idea of kenosis, emptying yourself, right? Okay? The original idea then, this is Athanasius in early, the early 300s. The original idea gets modified by Two Gregories and another guy that we'll talk about, uh, who ultimately solved this problem by uh, by developing the Trinitarian idea. But you can see at the beginning, it doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit at all. It only is talking about what do we do with this guy Jesus? Why did they? Have, why did they? Where was that thought that they had to do something with him? Ah, hold on just a second. Okay, the reason that they notice that this is a distinctive break from both paganism and Judaism. Okay, but not a complete break yet. Because Arius, look what Arius says. Jesus is a person of sublime moral accomplishments, adopted by God as his son, sacrificed to redeem humanity, raised from the dead, and granted divine status. Right? Now, this idea has threads in the Roman culture, so it's not unacceptable to half of the population. Because half of that population already knows that Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar were raised to the elevation of divinity by the, by the election of the Senate. Right? So it's not unusual for a man to become a god. But from Arius' perspective, it is unconscionable. And, uh, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for? Um, it's the word where you do something that causes another person to, to lose their status. It's defaming or humiliating. Okay, the idea is, if God has to become a man, that is humiliating. To God. It's humiliating to God. So Arius says that can't happen. You can't have a God become man, right? It's okay for man to become God because we have examples of that already. And, and if a man shows himself to be of the sublime moral character and his obedience is perfect, yes, he might be raised to divine status, but you cannot conscionably imagine that God himself would ever become a mortal <coughs> human being subject to defect, mm -hmm. right? Now, <coughs> behind this, behind this idea, is Platonism. Really, really deeply seated in the Hellenistic idea. Because, the Hellenist, because Platonism basically says the material world is defective, right? The material world is essentially <coughs> corrupt. It's only the spiritual world, the world of the true, the good, and beautiful for Plato, the forms, which are, in essence, uh, uncorruptible, okay? 
So if I have God in the spiritual world, how can he become part of the corrupt world? Right? No, it has to work the other way around. That God elects someone out of the corrupt world who then shows himself worthy to be elevated to the divine world. Right? Whereas Athanasius works in exactly the opposite way. What he says is, it's not possible for a corrupt human being to ever save the corrupt world. It must be the God of the incorruptible world who comes down into the corrupt world. It's the same idea, the same dualism, just yeah. seen it from the other perspective. Okay? So Arius has a high view of humanity because he believes that human beings can actually become moral, you know, respected moral agents, that God will recognize the effort that you put in and obedience matters. Athanasius is exactly the opposite. What he says is, no matter what you do at the human level, it will always be unworthy. He ultimately, he ultimately plants the seeds for total depravity in, Cal in Calvinism, right? Those, I mean, you, Calvin didn't invent this. It goes way, way back into the philosophical ideas of Plato, and right? And so what, what Athanasius is saying is, it's unimaginable that any human being could ever save a corrupt world because all humanity is corrupt. So it must be God who comes down and, 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 because, and he isn't corrupted because he is God, right? Uh, so the argument, now you can see how the argument centers on who is Jesus? Is he God who comes down to save or is he a man who's elevated to the status of divine? But don't they go by what scripture says he is? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> Phyllis, of course not. <laughs> no, these are, look, these are philosophical <laughs> ideas deeply embedded in the way that they in interpret scripture. So, I, don't, I mean, you certainly have all had this experience where you sit down with someone who doesn't agree with you theologically mm -hmm. and you use exactly the same verse to argue for two different positions, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, it happens all the time yeah. because it's not the verse that makes the difference or the, not the evidence yes. from scripture. It's the paradigm that guides how the verse is going to be understood. So here you have Arius with a very high view of humanity and Athanasius with a very low view of humanity. Mm -hmm. And their approach to who Jesus is depends entirely on what they think about human beings. <clears throat> and they read the verses according to their interpretive scheme. But before them, you know, there must have been yeah. some idea. Before then, it starts very early. It starts with this issue of what do we do with Jesus, right? Because, I mean, look, the earliest er, uh, church fathers are also struggling with the idea of a divine man, well, right? Say I am. I'm sorry? Yeah, who do you think I am? Right. They, but the earliest church fathers, by, by, the late, by the late 90s or the early 100s, they're already struggling with, because, because listen, they, they're not going to adopt the Jewish view of the Messiah. So that's right? basically They have to happens. create a different view to be distinct from the Jewish view. So that's In order why. to do that, they have to, <clears throat> they start off with a philosophical presupposition. Okay. The philosophical presupposition comes out of the Greek world. Okay. And now they take the scripture and try to understand it in terms of these So they, because they habits. block off everything from that <clears throat> side, they have to change everything to work right. for them. But, but it isn't that they block it off. It's that they're going to use it. They're going to use <clears throat> that Jewish heritage to prove the antiquity of their beliefs after they've reassessed the belief in terms of their current philosophical helmet. But they've also had to decide that they're not going to accept those They're beliefs. not going to be Jewish. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Well, they have no basis in that culture. Well, but, but yeah, at the, some the, point, the Greek but in the Hellenistic beginning, world, they did. The Greek Hellenistic world didn't have no, any. No, not the Greek, but the they, Romans, the, 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 the Gentiles <coughs> in the beginning they, did. They, had, they were part yes, of that. The, the, uh, the original Gentiles right. who were called by the Messiah into the assembly right. were connected to the Hebraic idea, the right. Jewish Messiah. Right. But by the time you get past the Bar Kokhba revolt, all, and they've all died and out. now in the mid hundreds, right, you start to see the early Greek educated church fathers create this division. Okay. And a and hundred years later, it shows up in the difference between Athanasius and Arius, which is where the conflict really takes uh, 
sh the conflict develops to the point of being in a, a crisis for the empire. Before it was just an argument over you know over which bishop you you're yeah. you're going to visit, but now it's a crisis in the empire. Okay. Okay. So the role of Satan. According to Athanasius' followers, Satan was cleverly persuading Arius and his followers to fall victims of heresy. Of I mean, listen, this is the That's best thing. <laughs> this is the best thing since sliced bread. The guy who disagrees with you is obviously Satan. in league with Satan. Yeah. Yes, right? That's easy. That, by the way, gives you the legitimate uh, justification for doing whatever necessary yes. to get rid of this evil. Absolutely. Right? The battle was, in other words, the battle was simply not concerning orthodoxy. This is really important because. When this battle begins, 50% of the Christian world believes the opposite of what you believe, right? Arius and Athanasius represent about 50% each of the Christian world, which means that it can't be about orthodoxy because orthodoxy embraces everything in Christianity. It's an internal argument about what it means to, to understand who Jesus is, but everybody who's arguing is inside the Christian church. Right? It's not pagans who are arguing with Christians, it's Christians who are arguing with Christians. 50% of the church, 50% of the church is Aryan. Right? So it becomes an internal spiritual warfare. You know, this is a, it's like uh, Shemaiah and Hillel. Right. Exactly, but that they're was, arguing was inside the circle. Right? But they they're didn't not think... arguing with the Greek philosophers who come from Athens. They're arguing with each other. But they didn't think the devil caused the other one. Well, and they didn't kill each other either, no. at least not at the beginning. So, <laughs> the heretics, in other words, whichever side you were on, the other side was in league with the devil. Well, that's not okay? how it is today. Yeah, yeah. Right. so heaven, hell, and Augusta. The idea of eternal reward and punishment comes, becomes the centerpiece of Christianity. In other words, if I can't make you, uh, and you know, by the way, Martin Luther does exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. If I can't convince you by compelling theological argument that I am right, and you consistently reject my compelling arguments, then you must be in, li in, in league with Satan, because that's the only way I can explain why you don't agree with me. Yeah, of course. Right? And the result of that is that there has to be reward and punishment. If it doesn't happen in this life, it'll happen in the next life. Mm -hmm. Right? God will get even, right? He's going to get you at some point or another, right? So that means that faith is not just correct belief. It's correct belief plus righteous acts. And those righteous acts have to be dictated by the bishop who tells you what it means for you to be a true believer. They decide. Right, okay? So the low view of humanity that's adopted by Athanasius, comes out of Plato, right, is that man is essentially corrupt and humanity is unworthy of the elevation to divine, which means that there cannot be a human Jesus who is elevated to the, the, the role of the Son of God, okay? God, in other words, God must become human in order to rescue us. There's no possibility of gradual moral improvement, which is what Athanasius is arguing about, or Arian is, or Arius is arguing about. So, the politics of the Trinity. What was happening in the empire? Well, the important part about this is we, if we look at what was actually happening politically in the empire, we can see not only is this the internal fragmentation, but the empire is being attacked. Look, this is mid-300s, right? The Roman Empire actually fails by 500, right? By the time uh, the, the Mongol hordes and, and a bunch of other invading armies come through, the Roman Empire is done, okay? It survives as the Holy Roman Empire, but it's far smaller than it was. So on the outside, I have political, uh, um, political tension from the attacking armies, and the emperor has to turn his attention and his forces to that issue. So he can't have an internal civil war going on at the same time because he doesn't have the ability to control it all, and the civil war disrupts the revenue flow and everything else that he needs in order to keep <coughs> the empire going, right? So the problem is that it's not simply... You know, I just thought of this. You could use the you can use the, the contemporary politics in America yeah, yeah. as a perfect yeah. example. Because you know what? It's the difference between Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the evidence anymore. It has to do with an ideology. Exactly. Right? So it doesn't actually what matter what happens in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. If I'm a Democrat, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Democrat, and I don't care what the evidence is, I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the Republicans, right? right? This tension 
that we feel today broke out in actual warfare between the, the population and the empire, the president is saying, I have to have unity, and the way I'm going to get unity is to bring all the bishops together and force them to come up with a creed that everyone can ascribe to. Okay? Now, there's two interesting things that happen here. The first is that I have to affirm the dominance of the Roman way. In other words, I can't have an empire where people have diversity of opinion. Because diversity of opinion will lead to civil unrest, mm -hmm. and civil unrest will affect the economics and politics of the empire, right? I need people to agree so they will pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. That's what it really comes down to, okay? So, that means that I almost, I have, to, I also have this view that the Roman Empire has a manifest destiny. The manifest destiny of the Roman Empire is to bring civilization to the world, yeah. right? So if I'm Roman, I believe that my civilization is the only civilization and everyone else is a barbarian. If I have civil unrest inside my emperor, empire, it calls into question my manifest destiny. Because now it looks like I don't have the kind of internal coherence that a civilized world would have. So I cannot allow this kind of internal strife going on because it affects the way I feel about what civilization is like, right? Okay? And by the way, this has immediate application to, uh, to several subsequent European and American civilizations. The idea that we're bringing, you know, as George H.W. Bush said, we're bringing uh, democracy to the world, as though that's the solution, right? Um, so the same idea filters through how we understand who we are today, right? Um, but it begins in this Roman idea that we are go we are this we are civilized people, as Cicero said. Our wars are no more violent than was necessary to bring civilization to the world. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter that we killed 1.2 million people and enslaved millions more. We did it in order to bring civilization to the world. Now they're civilized. Right. Okay. So, so what's really important here is this. This idea, by the way, this idea is also true of Israel. Right that the revival of past glory depends on social and spiritual unity. This is really an important idea that, that, that's not only in this argument, but finds its way through all kinds of other arguments, including the Messianic idea in Israel. And it, it works like this. I look to the past when Julius and Augustus ruled without exception. The Roman Empire was at its largest size under the under the um, under the dom uh, the domination of Julius and Augustus, right? They solved. They they defeated the Seleucids. They had captured the entire Mediterranean world. The empire worked. The glory days of Rome. Now I'm 200 years later, and the empire is cracking. And I look back and I say. Look, we had glory back there when everyone agreed, when we were doing what we needed to do, when we were fulfilling our destiny, when we had spiritual, in those days, pagan, but nevertheless, yeah. spiritual uniformity, right? The empire was working. We need to return to that kind of idea in order for us to, uh, to um, recover the loss of our uh, destiny, right? And by the way, Israel does exactly the same thing. By the time we get to uh, Hosea, king, right? You're looking back to Solomon and saying, wow, look what God did in the days of Solomon. It was so awesome. We were the most powerful. We were the wealthiest. We had more than anybody. Look at what we had. And he goes on and on all the numbers, right? And then you say, well, how come that didn't continue? Well, Solomon had in, uh, moral flaws. And those moral flaws led to the collapse of the, so, the Davidic kingdom. And now what we'll do is recover by having social and spiritual unity, and God will bless us again and we'll become, you know, the dog instead of the tail, right? Mm -hmm. The same idea mm -hmm. happens in Rome. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happening with this split of the bishops is that it's causing internal foment for, that is that is questioning the idea of Roman civilization. Mm -hmm. So, the argument doesn't, what I'm trying to make clear is that the argument doesn't turn on theology. The argument is turning on the political and economic impact of the theology. Okay? 
So, <coughs> religion as an arm of the state. So, Constantine, religious disunity was a threat to the empire. A Christian leader should emulate Greek philosophers. Okay? In other words, a Christian leader should become the philosopher king of Plato. Right? In the Republic, Plato talks about the philosopher king, the one who is, in, from our Western tradition, the perfect embodiment of Solomon minus women. Okay? That is <laughs> wealthy, powerful, wise, uh, capable of making rulings that only the a divine impartation could occur without, without the thousand women to distract it. If we just get rid of the thousand women, everything would have been fine. Okay? So, the great bishops then needed to find harmony in order to provide this foundation that the emperor could work with to carry forward the manifest destiny of Rome. And you asked, when did this all start? Origen, which who's very early, stirs the pot with this idea, subordinationism. And what he means is that, that <laughs> yes, Jesus is a god, but he's a lesser god. Right? He's subordinated to the Father. Well, that caused all kinds of disruption in the theological circles of the sure. bishops. And, they, and the East... The East accepted it, the Constantinople East, remember the Roman Empire is much bigger than just Europe, right? And the West rejected it. And so now you've got the bishops split over this idea, and now you start this whole process of councils to come together to create a creed that everyone can adopt, okay? So Arius and Alexander, 318, this is 318. The rejection of pre-existence becomes the issue over how I'm going <coughs> to develop this creed. The idea of God becoming human was offensive, right? And so Greek epistemology means it's either or, not both. You can't have, you can't, you got to have a right answer and a wrong answer, which means that the good news is that we can all become God's children, right? This is Arius. He's saying, listen, we could, it, when when the, when Yeshua in, uh, exhorts us to copy Him. He's saying that we can become like the Messiah, right? Because the Messiah is human. So we have the opportunity to do that. Athanasius is saying that's impossible. Human flesh is corrupt from the beginning. That, that's the other side of the argument. And it's not feasible to even imagine that this could happen. But something happens politically that allows Athanasius to win the argument. We'll see that in yeah, a Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's Athanasius that comes right. out ahead. So Bishop Alexander... Uh, rejected Arius's view. Jesus was the eternal God in human form. Uncreated, but not a second God. Remember, they had to get rid of this subordinationism idea. So the question then became, how could God become human? Right? And this was the beginning of the two natures solution, which is God is human, I mean, that Jesus is human, but he's also God. And they, you know, one nature, two, two, or two natures, one, one essence. So, when Bishop Alexander came out with this idea, he had to remove Arius from his office. And what he basically did was excommunicate Arius. Now, what you'll discover is that as we go along in this argument, one side excommunicates the other side, then they get back in power, then they excommunicate the guys who kick them out. It goes back and forth, back and forth the whole time. The same people are excommunicated and reinstated over and over and over as the political wind changes, right? It's kind of like the bureaucrats that belong to one Every thing is politics. Right. So, yeah. so what happens is Christianity becomes creedal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now we go through the councils and we get confessions. The idea that we're going to bring about uni uh, unity within this, this fractured uh, theology by coming up with a creed that everyone can endorse. And the first one is the Confession of Orthodoxy in 320. The bishops meet. Arius is, that what they, what they determine is that Arius is within the scope that's allowed by the creed, okay? So when they decide that, and by the way, Eusebius, who wrote the, the first really decent history of, of early Christianity, was uh, very closely connected with the emperor, and he put a lot of pressure on the bishops to allow a wide latitude for interpretation, because he is you know, the emperor's right-hand man to get people to agree that there can be diversity and we still have unity, okay? So in 321, the Council of Caesarea approves Arius, demanding Alexander reinstate him. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. What happens? In 325, Athanasius becomes the deacon under Alexander, and because he doesn't, because he believes that um, this would that this would reduce the high role of the church, right? If I, if any human being can just by obedience raise himself up, then what do I need the clergy for? Right? What do I need those intermediaries for? So Athanasius rejects what the, count, the previous council just four years before had agreed to and says, basically, in Antioch, no, we have to have a new term to settle this issue. And he comes up with this Greek term, Greek, the Greek idea of, of hypostasis, which, by the way, is not a biblical idea, but it's needed to bring about the notion that I can have a, a God who becomes a man in order to bring about the salvation of, of morally corrupt men. Okay, so Nicaea is the watershed event. Right? What does what the word need, mean? Hypo, hypo hypostasis. We have the Greek around. Can I get a drink? Please. The word God could become man is what he said. Um, yeah, unfortunately it changes meaning, as you know, in the history. It's confused everything. Yeah. Hypostasis, we're using the modern Greek pronunciation of Greek words. Hypostasis is that which stands under the substance of something, the basis of it. It does occur in Hebrews, as you know. Yes. The, the substance of God. It's yes. never used of three hypostases, never ever used of three. But God is said to have a substratum, the substance, the essence of God, if you like. Okay. It is that. It's a biblical word, but nothing like what they turned it into. And they and then they import another word as well yes. to Usia being yeah. being and then right. they made a distinction between Usia being and he passed us this substance. And then they reversed the meaning of those words. It's all about a muddle of words. It's absolutely but all about confusion of words. Oh, so they start confuse off with, everybody so much till they just believe whatever you say. Well, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> the <laughs> guy. Yeah. 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 Okay, so in Nicaea they addressed the question, what does it mean to be a Christian empire? And Constantine's quest for unity means that the people need a sense of their own world and a world that they can be confident that they know what, what's going to happen, right? It's predictable, right? Mm -hmm. So Constantine uses moral progress uh, as the way to describe what it means to be Roman. And to do that, he has to have some kind of authority, uniformity, and regularity. So he calls a council of 250 bishops. Unfortunately, there was a previous council of 500 bishops. <laughs> so they go back and the count. The councils are are called depending on the purpose of the one who calls by selecting the bishops who will agree with the yeah. purpose, right? And of course, all that does is cause more and more tension within the larger uh, scheme of all the bishops. So there's essentially a civil war. And we've just mentioned the use of this particular yes. Greek term, uh, which is about being, mm -hmm. right? And a Greek philosophical term that's imported now to describe the, the result mm -hmm. of this previous conflict. Arius basically says, how did a god divide himself? So that his own substance mm -hmm. takes on the form of a son, right? Mm -hmm. How is this idea to be understood? <laughs> In other words, are we going to translate the word essence according to essence, substance, reality, being, or type? Right? Which which word are we going to use? The emperor, however, is in the background demanding that there be conformity, but without a pope. Remember, there's no pope yet. Yeah. It's only the bishops, right? So there's nobody I can appeal to who's the ultimate <coughs> the ultimate yes. authority on this. It's just the bishops themselves who are the authority, and they're not in agreement. So. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the emperor becomes the final authority. And the bishops excommunicated each other back and forth on, and then appealed to the emperor to reinstate them. Constantine had a pagan priesthood to begin with, so he understands the role of authority in the pagan world, and he tries to force the Christian church to adopt the same kind of pyramid authority. right? But Nicaea, as Rubenstein says, Ni Nicaea is the watershed. It's the last point at which Christians with strongly opposed theological views act civilly toward each other. <laughs> After this, it's just open warfare. Mm. Okay, what happened next? Mm. The opponents were sinners, corrupt, malicious, malicious or satanic. <clears throat> I mean, they were accused of all kinds of things. If, they were, if you didn't agree with me, then I would accuse you of all kinds of crimes. They were dealt with by, on both sides. 
both sides. They were dealt with with physical and political repri reprisals. It was all about power. So it all depends who was in power at the time. That's right. The, well, it's not even who was in power. It's what location you happen to be in the empire. So if you were in Constantinople and the emperor was Arian, you were fine. But if you were in Alexandria and the emperor was Arian, and you were under the domination of Athanasius, who was not Arian, then you would be thrown in prison, excommunicated, so did the, emperor, did the emperor change constantly? No, the, no. Uh, <laughs> one emperor after another changed views. Oh. So Constantine has a, it dies and has a son. His view is a little bit different. He is killed and has a, another emperor. His view is different. So it was the political uh, situation of the empire that was causing this flux back and forth because there was no there was no religious final authority. How many emperors did they go through? Wait. Oh. So. <laughs> So what happened is, whichever empire or emperor was in force, whichever which other empire ruled, would force then the other part of the disagreeing body to conform. Was there different emperors in Alexandria and Constantinople, no. or they were one for Rome? Right. Okay. But what happens is Alexandria becomes almost a, a city state of its own. The power becomes so uh, Athanasius is so power power hungry that he actually gets in in direct conflict with him with the emperor. So, the internal contradiction, the bishops became the most powerful authorities in the land after the emperor. So what happens is, because, because there's no religious hierarchy, right? there's only the bishops, they become the voice of God in that particular city or community. And after the emperor, they're the most powerful people, but they don't agree. Right? They espouse a life of humility, but they were the most powerful people yeah. around. How does so, that work? Right. So here are the guys who are talking about humility and, servi and, and uh, servitude are the ones who, who really rule in the area. Well, don't the people yeah. think that's pretty hypo hypocritical? No, the, but you understand that in this world, you are attached to the bishop of your community. He is the voice of God to you. You do not question him. Right? Besides which, you can't read the text anyway. He's the one who's telling you what the text says. Okay, so so by the time we get to uh, two years after Nicaea, right, most of the decisions of the council were overturned. The Arians regained power through through Eusebius's influence, who becomes the bishop of Constantinople. The consensus of Nicaea was largely political and didn't represent the theological diversity. So, in spite of the fact that you have this wonderful benchmark in Christian history called the Council of Nicaea, yeah. it really didn't accomplish much. It, it basically was still in the, in the midst of this political swing. So Athanasius then returns to Alexandria. And when he does that, he creates a Christian mafia, essentially a Christian mafia. He rules Alexandria apart from the emperor, right? I mean, the emperor actually even excommunicates him at one point and has to send uh, essentially a police force down there to take him prisoner. And when they arrive, his mafia overcomes the police force and throws the captain in prison and later tries to hang him. I mean, it's just absolute civil war, right? So he, Athanasius, declares that the emperor is unfit to lead the church. What does that imply? That I am and the emperor isn't, right? What happens is Athanasius argues that if God can do anything he wants, and if he decides to become a man, what could possibly prevent him from it? Right? Because he can do anything, right? The argument, according to Rubenstein says, the argument sounds reasonable on the surface, but it relies on imagining that God could do things that are logically impossible if God is a, and being human are not ontologically equal. Right? So even though we have the words, as Anthony said, we have the words, but they they're um, <laughs> They're muddled. They're, they're, uh, there's equivocation going on in all respects so that this, I can use a word that means something in ordinary language, but in the theological context, it means something completely different. In fact, I don't have any reference in, or, in ordinary language that will even tell me what the word means. So it relies on my, it relies on my, um, ordinary understanding, but then immediately tells me, but it's not used that way, right? Well, um, just, what do you mean by the sentence, impossible if God and be, being human are not on the Okay, so people? if, yeah, remember, what Arian said mm -hmm. is that, that um, Jesus is an ordinary human being. Mm -hmm. 
so God can elevate right. him to divine status. Okay. But if it, if but but <coughs> Athanasius' view is that God is unique, uniquely different, ontologically different than human beings. Okay. So how can a God? How can a divinity become this corrupted human nature? Okay. Right? Um, okay. So you can see that this starts the two natures doctrine. How we're going to avoid this problem? Okay. So what happens is this. Uh, you know, fate, the fate of history often determines the outcome of theology. Yes. Yes. So what happens is this. Arius, uh, the debate is going back and forth. Arius is aligned with the emperor. A Athanasius is fighting the emperor and Arius, right? Lots of, lots of <laughs> mob violence. And Arius gets some sort of intestinal oh disease. God. And they go to a council meeting, a big council meeting, and the day before the council meeting, he gets really violently sick. He goes into the toilet, and the next time they go find him, he is dead on the floor in the toilet, right? I'm sure they say that was an act of God. And Athanasius says he considered his death an act of God to remove the heretic, proving that oh his God. view of God was correct. <laughs> so... Unfortunately for the Arians, Constantine died in 337. So now you don't even have the emperor standing behind trying to get this reconciliation going. And the Arians then, and the followers of Athanasius, enter even more violent conflicts. Territories and cities were aligned on each side. <coughs> it's like New York being opposed to what was happening in Newark, right? And they're fighting across the river. Wasn't there a new emperor after Constantine? I'm sorry? Wasn't there a new emperor? Yes. So what happens after Constantine dies is that a new emperor comes in. Uh, the Council of Antioch charges Athanasius with mob violence, murder, misappropriation of funds, false imprisonment of opponents. Right? The new emperor, Constantine's son, Constantus, actually sends the police force to arrest the guy. And then they have this battle, and because of Athanasius basically mafia in Alexandria, they actually imprison the guy who sent there to arrest him. Okay? He then convenes his own Egyptian bishop council in 338, which clears him of all charges. Egyptian? <laughs> yeah, because, remember, it's the Mediterranean world, so Alexandria is in Egypt. Oh, okay. Right? Oh, okay. But the eastern bishops meet again in 339, one year later, and convict him of violence and mayhem. It's, oh, my God. Yeah, it's an interesting history. So along comes the next em the next uh, emperor. Uh, no, this is the captain of the guards who was sent by the emperor to arrest Athanasius. He flees the city, interrupts in riots and, vi and, and arson, murders and, and mob violence, including actually burning down of churches, right? The emperor empire was then almost equally split between these two opponents. <coughs> and of course that that brings up the question is, how am I going to avoid a civil war? So the emperor gets involved and he says, listen, this, this can't continue. The answer was forced compliance. So he positions the truth as, uh, as whatever he, wherever he aligned himself with this, this conflict. And everyone else was, uh, a fight, uh, was uh, obviously demonic, and therefore the emperor could demand theological uniformity on pain of death. So Constantus favored the Eastern Arians, right? And he convened nine councils from, from 351 to 360. Nine different councils of the bishops to enforce this idea. In 357, this particular council declared that the Arian doctrine was officially promoted as the Christian doctrine. Now, think about this. We, today, in the West, no one even thinks, I mean, Ari Arianism is a heresy, yeah. Right? Yeah. But in 357, it was declared as the absolute theological doctrine of the Christian church. Two persons, the Father and the Son, right? An attempt, they, were, they made an attempt to ban the idea of essence. Remember, we talked about the influence of that Greek term, right? The emperor then approved this idea and called, called a council of 600 bishops to, to agree and bring this uniformity. But politics outweighed it, and mm -hmm. what happened is mm -hmm. the Latin arm, which we grew out of, right, the Roman Catholic Church is the Latin side of Christianity, the Latin arm rejected this and excommunicated all of the Eastern arm. 
So now you have the final split between what is essentially going to become Rome and Constantinople. Right? Christianity covered all of that. But what happened after this council meeting is that the, the West, the Latin West, rejected everything that the council said and basically said the entire church from that was centered in Constantinople was acting as uh, uh, in league with the devil. So I wonder, knew, I wonder what it have been, how different it would have been if, it, if they weren't. Yeah, well, you don't have to wonder because the Eastern Church continued on its Aryan track and, and its or, and orthodoxy in the Eastern Church is very different than the West, yes. Oh. Was that the biggest council? The Smyrna, 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 Smyrna. Council, Sermian Council, was that the biggest one? The biggest In terms one. of numbers? Uh, with the 600 bishops? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it might have been. I'm not sure if it was the biggest one or not, but the, there's a lot of bishops, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they can they can pull bishops from both sides. Um, so yeah, that, that was my question. If that was the biggest one that pulled uh, I uh, think, both sides. Um, I think it might have been the biggest one. When, but, but what when happens is this. Constantine's son dies, and a new emperor comes in, Julian. When, right? when you say um, two persons and the father and the son, that was two separate, right? God, right? Two separate divine two sep beings. But they were both divine. Yeah, because. But they, he didn't. He didn't believe. You sh but he, he got elevated to God to right? to, in, so You end up with two gods: God the Father and God the Son. Well, that's that's <coughs> two gods actually, but they, yeah. but he didn't believe that. He, but he believed he was human, though, right? But elevated, but elevated to divine status. So that's so that's still totally. Different. Yeah, well, it was rejected by the Western Church as heresy. But the Western believes. The Western Church hasn't finished developing its doctrine yet. So wait a minute. Okay, so Julian comes to power, and Julian comes to power in the middle of the Civil War. And what does he say? This isn't working. Christianity is is ridiculous. My empire is fractured all over the place. We're going to bring back paganism. At least it worked. <laughs> and he tried to reinstate <clears throat> the pagan practices and temples and everything else in the Roman Empire. Because remember, the glory days of Rome under Julius and Augustus were days of paganism. Right? So the church responds. Athanasius embraces the conservative block of the Arians. This is really interesting. right? Athanasius says... Yeah, Athanasius says, hey, listen, there's some of you over there who are opposed to paganism no matter what. You're, if we have a common enemy, then we should be brothers. So Athanasius invites the conservative Arians to join him in forces to defeat the emperor's move. And fate again, Julian is killed in battle. And paganism does, dies with him, right? The church is vindicated because the really vicious, terrible, terrible pagan emperor died in a battle. Okay, what happened? In its final form, then, remember now we're into the fourth, we're now into the fourth emperor since Wait, all this is What year is this? Um, this is about 380. In its final form, these guys, Gregory of Nyssa, Basil of Cappadocia, and Gregory of Nazantius, they create the, the final piece of this, of this doctrine. They introduce <laughs> the idea of the person of the Holy Spirit. Right? In other words, up to this point, no one's been arguing about the person of the Holy Spirit at all. It's all the issue is always about is the divinity of Jesus. Now these three guys take Athanasius' idea and they reformulate it so that they now have three persons in one being. Mm -hmm. Right? The United Conservative Arians and Athanasius' followers got on board because they just re they had just responded to an emperor who was trying to reinstate paganism. God is one essence in three persons, a distinction between usia and hypostasis, right? Mm -hmm. So the three individuals sharing one essence becomes the center of the, of the ref reformation of the doctrine. And that means that it's completely distinct from Jewish monotheism yes. and opposed entirely <laughs> to the idea that a human being could be elevated to divine status, mm -hmm. okay? So... In three seven, oh, sorry, I gave you the wrong date. In 373, okay. Athanasius dies. Mm -hmm. The new emperor Valens is killed in battle in 378. It's wor it's Rome's worst defeat ever, mm -hmm. right? So if you have if you have manifest destiny and God is on your mm -hmm. side and you have the true belief, and you and you lose in the worst battle of defeat that you ever had, mm -hmm. guess what? 
you have to have an explanation. That's true. You have to have an explanation of why that happened, right? Again. Bishop Ambrose claimed that the defeat was the verdict of the gods against a uh, verdict of God against the Arians. In other words, that group of Arians who were still hanging on to their elevated humanity were the reason that the emperor. It affected em everybody. They it affected everybody. Yeah, no, it was the worst they're defeat that the Roman Empire had ever had, right? And it had to come from some place, and it must have come from the spiritual defectiveness of the Arian belief. So they caused it. Right. So they caused it. The central idea of Arian thought was the gradual improvement of man. But now this seemed impossible because the civilization, which has the manifest destiny of improving the world, had just been defeated by barbarians <laughs> in the worst possible battle that you could imagine, right? So now it looks like the barbarian forces are actually overcoming the idea that Rome is bringing civilization to the world, right? That means it must be the punishment of God. For what? The punishment of God for? For them, for them not being in, in uniformity over this oh. doctrine, oh. right? So the sense of vulnerability in the empire causes the West to break entirely from the East and say, you know what? The, if you guys want to go that way, you can be in league with the devil, but we are not going to do that anymore. Our identity is based in this doctrine, because this doctrine will guarantee us now that God will protect us and bring us back into a state of uniformity and triumph. Right? The Arian doctrine was then uh, assigned as punishable <laughs> by death. So from this point on, from 373, look how long we've gone. From 373, right? We've had uh, almost a hundred years of battle to get to the point where the Arians are finally said, if you, if you believe in Arian doctrine, you, you're executed. The yes. state didn't enforce that? Um, did the state have a death penalty for heresy? or? Yeah, they did, actually. At that they, time? Yeah, they had a death penalty. And what's really interesting is that previously they had a death penalty for for uh, other religions. The Roman Empire wasn't had during, used this before. During all these years, the hundreds of years that that was going on, were the Jews still living in Yeah, of course, the Jews were spread out all over the empire, but they're also persecuted, of course, because they obviously aren't going to adopt this doctrine. So the campaign. A long wave of violence begins against the heretics. There's a, a massive schism, schism with the East. <laughs> Fallen humanity could only be saved by God. Jesus had to be God to save us. The cult of the Virgin Mary begins. Oh, it starts there? Yep, starts there. And the adoption in its final form was in 381. So from 299 to 381, nearly 100 years, the church was in, entirely involved in this controversy. And during most of that time, there was a back and forth over which doctrine was going to be adopted, and at some points, actually, the acceptance of both of views. Right? But in the end, the West... The, the Athanasius Gregory modification in the West dominates Western Christianity, and you and I are the inheritors of that. Yep. If we'd grown up yep. in the East, if we'd grown up in the Greek world or the Russian Orthodox world, we'd have a different view of this. Mm -hmm. But we, by accident of birth, have become the inheritors of this tradition and this argument that lasted for almost 100 years. So the Russian Orthodox well, Church, they still yeah. believe the other way? The, the Russian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church are much, much more. Uh, a second. Friendly. <laughs> they're much, they're much more. Of, um, they, they're much more aligned with Arian's view of the, of the. Um, humanity. The huma the high role high of humanity, humanity, right? Whereas the, mm -hmm. the Western view follows. And you can see it in the Reformation, Calvin and Luther, mm -hmm. with this very low view of humanity. Yes. So, but, but they still yeah. believe in the Trinity. Um, yes, sort of. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Depends. Right? We'll see. Okay. So here's the history lessons. The, the, look, in order to understand what happens in the Trinity, you have to understand the, the role of the general political situation. In other words, the... The, 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 ultimately, the development of the doctrine of the Trinity depends on the politics of the day, right? Who's in power, who isn't in power, which, which other influences surround the empire are affecting what happens inside the empire, right? It also depends on the power of the state and the church, how those two came in conflict with each other. It depends on the populace's need for assurance. If I believe that if I am 
is that if I'm obedient to God and God will therefore bless me with prosperity, victory, and ultimately the manifest destiny of bringing civilization to the world, and that doesn't happen, there must be a reason, and the reason must be a theological one, a spiritual one, right? You have to have a role for manifest destiny. If you're going to see how this doctrine develops, it doesn't come about by a theological argument. It comes about because I believe that the Roman way of life is the correct way of life. And now that it's, a side, it's a, attached to the church, that kind of power means that I need to force people to believe it. Okay? It's also about the role of individual personality. Right? So how I identify myself will become part of the way that the doctrine of Trinity is developed. And finally, it's about forced conformity and the defeat and loss of hope when I don't see what God, what I believe God has promised for those who are obedient, who are obedient, coming true. Right? And we, and this, look, this reason this is a history lesson is because it's happened again and again and again. It's not just happening in the third and fourth centuries in Rome. It's happened over and over and over as we see the religious part of our existence. Uh, affected by the political, economic, and social tides of what's happening in the civilization at the moment. So when they teach this stuff, do they teach this stuff in seminary? No. <laughs> not, not at all. Of course not. So, so, just the unless you're, unless you're a historian, right. you're not going to have any idea right. that this it, What you learn in seminary is the doctrinal issues, yeah. right? You learn the difference... Uh, between you learn that Arian was a that Arianism is a heresy, and you learn why. You learn that that you don't talk. You might not even talk about Athanasius, but you talk about the Trinitarian development post Gregory, right? And you and the discussion will be as Anthony will show you. The discussion will be about how all of the text then is used to proof text the argument. But no one will tell you that it was a Roman defeat in the em in, in Emperor that it, Valens. The political and the stability right. and all that. No conflict. one's going to talk about that because the church history has been modified so that it serves the purposes of the winner, yes. which is the church. Yeah. But right? the church knows. Uh, yes, they're not. Yeah, they're they're not that, I mean, I mean look, I, I taught hundreds of pastors. They don't know. No, I they mean, I mean, let's say the church, you know, like the you mean the, the pope, historians the bishops, in the church. The, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, sure, but it's history. But but, yeah, but the whole the point is that I'm anyway. Yeah, but here's the point: <laughs> the history isn't relevant these days. The history is not relevant to the belief system, right? In other words. The actual evidence about what happened doesn't matter. That's right. That's right. That's right. What matters is what you believe now. Right. It doesn't make any difference how you got there. Yeah. That's right. And that's the lesson that we learned from this little history lesson, is that now, today, if you walk into any, I, mm. I will dare you to walk into any church, mm. any church, mm. and ask them <laughs> to explain to you how the defeat of Emperor Valens affected the doctrine of the Trinity. They have no idea. Nobody in the church has any idea. They don't even know what manifest destiny of Rome has to do with it. Right? But the, so what happens is, what matters to them is, what do you believe now? What do you believe that the text tells you today? Not, Not why you believe it or whether it's true. doesn't matter. <laughs> it's true because I believe it. But I believe it goes even further than that. What I'm seeing is that, you know, I'm listening to all of this and I'm like, whoa, man. It's the bishops now are just the different denominations, and they send their people to go to where it's taught what they believe. That's so right. people okay. just go like, yeah, well, if you're, you you're going to be in the Southern it. Baptist, you got to go to the New Orleans Southern Baptist Seminary. Or you go to Denver Southern or Denver Baptist Seminary. It goes or you go to the board. Yeah, it it's, the it's the same all the way across. Yeah, nobody indoctrination. Yeah, nobody teaches. Look, nobody teaches the the actual circumstances of the development of any of these doctrines, nor the opposing positions. They teach so that the pastor will preach a particular form of the doctrine well, because if they, that's acceptable if to If they them. taught that, people might say, wait a minute, this may not even be real. Well, we want affirmation of what we already believe. That's why changing that's the paradigm is so hard. Is right. That's we right. want people to affirm that's what we believe. That's very true. Right. That's right. However, the positive in it is that there is, and, and we are experiencing it more and more, there are people who are waking up and who want to know. So they there are. Skip 
We see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of Democrats not even on Skid Row, but that are waking up and are wanting to know. Yeah. The problem is when they wake up <coughs> and they want to know and they go to the church, oh, they can't yeah. find out. Yeah. <coughs> because there's nobody in the church that can, that can instruct them. Well, that right? one would even want to. And, the pro and then, of course, they feel like, where, where, can I, where can I go? They find a place where they start to learn, and then the church community excommunicate. Right, they would be murdered. Because yeah. now they're outsiders, right? They're no longer supporting the belief system which keeps the structure yes. of, the, of wow. the church going. Right? They're called the Duns. The Duns. <laughs> yeah. Yes, David. So, so um, can we go back for a second? There's yeah. a couple things that... Um, Oops, I went the wrong way. I'm, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on a little bit. One Maybe. Is, um, <laughs> how does this... Where do you want to go back to? Well, it, no, it's just the idea. You, so you, if you look at Athanasius and Arius, <coughs> it's sort of two sides of the same coin, in a sense, because they're yeah. both saying there could be a God-man. Mm. Yes. So it's how we got it's there. How we look, it's how, how we got there. That's right. Mm. Which is so divorced from the right. Jewish view. Yeah. Uh, right. Now, look, neither one of these guys are adopting a Jewish <coughs> Messiah. Right. 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 That's so the I have is but, but where does think, that break it? But think that Arius is much closer because what does he say? He says Jesus is a human being, yeah. born in a special kind of way, mm. right? Uh, chosen by God to play this particular role, and upon completion of the role, elevated. So he right? keeps some Which of it. Which is very much yeah, a he, Jewish idea. He keeps some of it. But by the time he's done, he still has two gods. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. It's just a different way of understanding. I mean, he has two gods, whereas the Jewish, you know, the scriptural idea is one god, Yahad, right? That's it, mm -hmm. one god. But Arius uh, ends up with two. Mm -hmm. It's just that Athanasius starts from the other end. And he says there are always two gods, basically one god with two persons who, you know, and then that creates all of the equivocation over what that means. So That's fine with that. To, if you go back to Acts, for example, you see Paul and is it Barnabas or Silas, where they, they want to call one Zeus and mm -hmm. one Hermes. They, I mean, they've already got this idea, obviously. But that's a man but, can be God. Yeah, but that's the whole point. Yeah. In the Roman world, yes. this is not unacceptable. Right. Right? So the question I have then is, is there a way to delineate and kind of pinpoint even the time frame, general time frame, that this that mentality just kind of overwhelms... Yeah. Christianity. Oh, okay, so what happens? Yeah, you, you have a general, I don't think you can pinpoint it, yeah. but you have a general idea. Here's generally what happens, right? You've got Christian elements influenced by Greek philosophy beginning about the middle of the of the second century. So say 130 to 160, right? Is that the, early, the early church fathers are starting to struggle with philosophical ideas that they inherited from mm. Hellenism mm. and <coughs> applying them to to reinterpret the Jewish texts, yes. okay, but it's but it's very it's very uh, mixed, right? I mean, they got both they got a foot in both worlds, okay. What happens along the way? This is the fate of history. What happens along the way is that they get the power of the empire behind them. In 150, 150 more years or 200 years, now they have the empire behind them. Now it becomes not a, just a religious issue. Now it becomes an empire issue, and now it affects the social, political, and economic well-being of the empire. And when that happens, then Constantine says, "We can't have this this fracturing going on because it's affecting my political outcomes." When that happens, it doesn't. It's not a role of the church anymore. Now it's a, it's a complete civilization-wide issue, and, so and I force have to force people to comply. So what I find interesting then is because obviously, if you speak to any modern Christian, we talk about this a little bit. You know, Trinity is embedded in the sure. mindset. Sure. Of, of From church. 387. Right. right. But that's the. <laughs> We've had a long time to think about this. <laughs> there, there is a point where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is now become the third part. Yes. Yeah. Very late in the game. Mm -hmm. So how does that not 
jar people to some extent because, because the, even if the argument goes on for 200 years, but they don't know where it came yeah, from. Because, because, because think about it. Report. If I finally settle the issue that God, that one God can be two persons, why not three? What's the matter? What's, What's the problem? Why not three? It's the same concept, right? Uh, there, there's a, a couple of other issues that are going on that, that you can explore in the book where he talks about how that came up. But the, but the point is, I first need to settle this idea about the, the essence of God, right? Once I've got that idea settled, now I can go to the text and say, yeah, but he's referred to as the Holy Spirit, as the Son, as the Father, so what's the problem? Uh, Skip? Yes. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, we we're asking ourselves, this is probably one, if not the only, type of presentation out there that we will be able to watch on YouTube Absolutely. when we upload it. So thank you for your work, okay. for your zeal for this. Yes. Uh, one one comment, uh, you brought up the so-called Cappadocian Fathers, the three Gregories. Yeah, yeah, three, the Gregory, Gregory, two Gregories. Two, yeah. two Gregories, sorry. And, yeah. um, there's a good uh, book by Wolfson, W-O-L-F, Wolfson, uh, The Philosophy of the Church Fathers. Yes. And he makes an interesting comment, I don't know if you've read that book, uh, that ne uh, Gregory of Nyssa, or Nyssa said that what they created was a medium between the, yeah. the uh, evils of Jewish monotheism, <laughs> the Shema, mm -hmm. and the evils of paganism, mm -hmm. and what they created, the two Gregories right. and the other guy, was a medium. To, it, 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 I see it as a bridge. They wanted to bridge both sides. They saw as evil with this new idea of the Trinity. Can you yep. comment on that? Uh, I remember that Rubenstein talks about that, um, but I, I, I don't have, I can't right. add anything to what But you do you see that, that dichotomy yeah. there? That I mean, obviously at the end, Athanasius and Arius were arguing about something um, far more specific, the, okay. the role of Jesus, yeah, right? Truth, it was and just then a at the political expediency. Yeah, I mean, what? Yeah. Look, behind all of this is, if the empire is going to fulfill its God-given destiny yes. to bring civilization to the world, it has to be in agreement. You cannot have religious factionism going on all over the place and fulfill this manifest destiny of this of bringing civilization. So somehow we have to find a way so that everyone, so one of two things will happen. Everyone agrees or those who agree are going to retain the power and kill the other ones. Right? Cool. So, so, that, so basically at this point Christianity is, you know, we're right, the Jews are wrong anyway, and this is the way it's going to be. Right. So the Jews are evil, in the West. as he said, in the West, right. right. But you know what I was thinking when I was talking to Larry on the way here, I was, it came over and I said, so in scripture, Old Testament basically, um, the Tanakh, does it tell you how to view the Messiah? Oh, stop. How, oh, okay. we're, we're treading on the next. Oh, okay. Oh, good. I'm going to save that question for because you. Because the only okay. thing that we're interested in here is that you have to understand. Okay, look, history. Okay. The way that we normally come at the Trinity is, as David suggested, everybody believes it's always been there. Yeah. You know, it's so like embedded in archaeology that we think. You couldn't be Christian without Trinity. In fact, I remember John <laughs> McDo or MacArthur. Yes. Saying that if you don't believe in the Trinity, you can't be saved. Right. Yeah, right. Okay? right so yeah. think about that. There were for for nearly 400 years, the church debated this, and nobody said you couldn't be saved if you didn't agree because there wasn't any agreement. Right. It's only post 400 A.D. That the church begins its process, or the the process of persecuting those who don't believe. And with right? that idea that you can't be saved unless you believe in the Trinity, how in the world would you expect a Jewish person to ever believe in Yeshua? You, at this you time? have to become. You, you have to become. Yes, Christian. and yet they do. So. Yes, just, I, they do. But you understand that what we're the only thing that we did here is to say, listen, the embedded idea that Christianity is Trinitarian. Yeah. It's not true, right. right? It is true since 400, but before that, all this argument went on. Yeah. So we'll yeah, just take a little. Mary in there, we can have a queen. Yeah, yeah. Throw yeah. Mary in there. Yeah. I mean, right, you have to have exactly. a queen. If you got a king, you have to have a queen. Yeah, right. Okay, so <laughs> so we're just going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back, and Anthony will start off on helping us understand the role of the Messiah. Why?